Good afternoon. I want to welcome all of you to this afternoon's event. Uh, my name is Rick Bold. I'm a 3L. I'm the president of the Federal Society here at Penn. Uh, and we are very pleased to sponsor this debate today on the proper role of foreign and international law in US constitutional interpretation. Um, the Federal Society, for those of you who don't know, is the largest uh, conservative and libertarian legal organization in the country. And rather than being a political organization, um, the society seeks to promote three different legal principles. First is that the state exists to preserve freedom. Uh, second is that the separation of powers is central to the Constitution. And third, that it's the role of the judiciary to say what the law is and not what the law ought to be. Here at Penn, we try to host debates. And our goal is to bring in um, someone who is the best advocate for one side and put them up against the best advocate for another side. And I think we're all lucky to have exactly that here today. Um, this is a very important and timely topic. Um, Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer debated this very issue in 2005. Um, it also came up a lot in the uh, Sotomayor confirmation hearings this past summer. Um, let me give a brief introduction to the two speakers. Ilya Shapiro is visiting us, and he is a senior fellow in constitutional studies at the Cato Institute, which is the country's leading libertarian policy organization. And he is also editor-in-chief of Cato's Supreme Court Review. Before joining Cato, he was special assistant and advisor to the Iraq multinational force on rule of law issues. And he also practiced international, political, and commercial law at Patton Boggs and Cleary Gottlieb. Mr. Shapiro has contributed to a variety of academic and popular publications, including the LA Times, Washington Times, Legal Times, Roll Call, and the Weekly Standard. He has also regularly provided commentary on a host of ABC, CBS, and NBC. He holds a bachelor's degree from Princeton University, a master's degree from the London School of Economics, and a JD from the University of Chicago Law School. Professor Deborah Pearlstein is our other speaker, and she has joined Penn Law this semester as a visiting faculty fellow in national security and international human rights. She comes to us from the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University, where she has worked since 2007. Professor Pearlstein holds a bachelor's degree from Cornell and a JD from Harvard Law School, where she served as an articles editor for the Harvard Law Review. After law school, she clerked on the First Circuit, as well as for Justice uh, Stevens on the US Supreme Court. Before beginning her career in law, uh, Professor Pearlstein also served in the White House from 1993 to 1995 as a senior editor and speechwriter for President Clinton. Today, Professor Pearlstein is a frequent speaker on security-related topics in US constitutional and international law, and she has repeatedly testified before Congress on questions of US detention and interrogation policy. Um, so I think it's clear that we have two of the top experts in the field here today, and I think we're all looking forward to what they have to say. They're each going to present for about 15 minutes, and then follow up for five minutes apiece, and then we're going to open it up to uh, questions from all of you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for having me here. I think this is my first time back at Penn since I was a student at Princeton and going to uh, basketball games. I remember once my senior year was the, uh, the biggest comeback in, uh, in Ivy League basketball history. I think we were down something like 29 points at the half, which in Ivy League basketball, of course, is, is a huge amount. Uh, and ended up, ended up coming back and uh, winning by one or two points. It was the, the miracle at the palestra, and I have great memories of that, and I apologize if that makes any of you uh, cringe. Um, so what are we talking about here? The use of uh, a foreign and international law and, and constitutional interpretation. Those are two kind of separate issues. They're related. You know, foreign law is the decisions of foreign courts and the state of the law in foreign countries. Uh, international law can be many things. It can be treaties that the U.S. has party to or not. There's some controversy about the effect of that. Uh, customary international law, was, which is its own kind of can of worms. Um, the, the law of nations, kind of an international, which becomes a federal common law, is applied to uh, admiralty especially and piracy, some, some of these other uh, traditional law of nations that, the, uh, that existed at the time of the Constitution's ratification. Uh, but all of these uh, types of law have uh, similar problems when they're being applied, uh, when they're being used to interpret the US Constitution. And uh, 
Now, now Professor Perlstein and I haven't, haven't talked before this debate, so it could be that she talks more about one aspect, I talk more about another, but I'm sure in any event, uh, the issues will be joined and we'll get more into it on rebuttal and, and Q&A. Um, this isn't really a debate about conservative versus liberal or libertarian uh, interpretive theories of the Constitution, although the, the opponents tend to be similar. Um, and uh, as, since we're still talking about the shape of the table, as you know, we do a lot in, in diplomatic and international law, uh, a few more definitions to throw at you exactly what I mean by the use of, of foreign law. Um, U.S. courts actually rarely cite foreign law, and uh, it's not necessarily an increasing trend. Um, most of the times that the courts do it, it's not problematic, for example, for interpreting treaties, uh, such as the Medellin case recently. You look to how foreign courts, your you know, contracting fellow contracting parties interpret that, that, that law. Uh, for interpretations of customary international law, which I said is, an, is a different controversy, but uh, we have things like the Charming Betsy Canon, the Presumption Against Extraterritoriality, the Paquete Habana, all these different aspects that are not controversial at all and that you will cover in your international law courses if you haven't uh, yet. The coordination of litigation, right? There's big multinational companies suing each other and uh, there might be a, a choice of law provision that says, you know, use this law or whatever. Well, obviously you would use uh, that uh, foreign law in that case. Passing references, um, you know, if, if you're looking at whether the, um, the Congress uh, had a, a rational basis for something, well, something that goes to the rationality of something will be if some other legislature has passed a bill uh, that way. That's not exactly a reference to foreign you know, law, judicial decision, but it is a reference to um, um, lawmaking, I guess. And finally, there's, uh, this is the controversial one, for interpreting domestic law, uh, using what foreign courts or international courts uh, have decided to interpret the U.S. Constitution or federal statutes. And this is driven largely by the need to acknowledge foreign litigation and law in a globalized world, um, uh, but isn't a choice to internationalize uh, our law, I, I, would, th I would think. Um, and. Uh, one other thing is that, that the courts tend to use this most for antitrust, uh, telecommunications, uh, all these sorts of things, um, which nobody gets really heated about. So why do we have all this concern, and why was it such a central part of the Sotomayor hearings? Um, well, first of all, the Supreme Court uses foreign law more than other courts tend to, now, with some exceptions, the Second and Ninth Circuit uh, do for, for certain types of cases. And they use it in, in high-profile cases requ requiring moral judgments, so the death penalty, uh, homosexual rights, uh, all of these kind of fraught things with the, with the culture wars. Uh, this issue really started about 20 years ago with a trio of Florida cases about the constitutionality of holding someone on death row a long time. The argument is uh, holding someone on death row for a long time is itself cruel and unusual. Uh, it seems kind of like a, a, a bizarre argument to me because, you know, if, some, if somebody wanted to be uh, executed right away, they could just waive all their appeals and they wouldn't be held on death row, I, I, I mean, it, on the merits. But anyway, that's, that's where it started. There was a trio of Florida cases, Elledge, Knight, and Foster in 98 through 2002 where cert was denied. The court did not review those cases, but in dissenting from those denial, denials, Justice Breyer would cite the uh, European Court of Human Rights, the UN Convention on Human Rights, and courts in Canada, the UK, Jamaica, and once Zimbabwe, which he uh, has since admitted that he uh, regrets and that he was only doing that to uh, strengthen the legitimacy of the Zimbabwe Supreme Court. Now we can question whether that's a, a legitimate uh, task for the US Supreme Court to do. And then of course, more recently, we had the, the cases of Atkins, uh, which uh, involved uh, uh, the death penalty applied to uh, mentally retarded people, uh, discussion involved discussing views held in the world community on this. Uh, Lawrence versus Texas about homosexual sodomy and kind of the selective use of citations in, in parts of the world that had um, you know, changed their, their treatment of sodomy. And Roper versus Simmons in 2005 uh, involving uh, the application of the death penalty to uh, those who were 16 and 17 when they committed their, their murders. Um, had a long discussion about the, on both sides of the, of the uh, controversy about use of foreign law. Justice Ginsburg, well now actually we have, before I go into that, we have now this fall, it's even more timely because this fall we have a case, uh, two cases, Graham versus Florida and Sullivan versus Florida, which involve um, uh, life sentences without parole for non-homicide crimes as applied to juveniles. Is that cruel and unusual? And we actually, Cato, joined uh, 12 or 13 other organizations in filing a brief in this case. Not on the criminological or moral merits of that kind of sentencing, but just saying 
don't apply foreign law. Uh, you know, and if you're going to think about customary international law, we'll use the same way that the, the, the test the court laid out for the alien tort statute in uh, Sosa uh, versus Alvarez Machine, which essentially brings it back to the standard uh, at play uh, in terms of the law of nations and piracy, these sorts of federal common law uh, things uh, at the time of the founding. Um, Justice Ginsburg, several justices have, have, have made st statements about uh, this issue. Justice Ginsburg has said that using foreign international law fits into the living constitution view uh, of interpreting the constitution because while standards evolve, we look to how the, wor how the world uh, does things. Um, in her separate opinion in, in Grutter, the Michigan Affirmative Action case, uh, she cited the 1979 Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, admitting that the U.S. hadn't signed this treaty. So, I mean, in effect, the argument is stronger on the other side, saying the U.S. hadn't um, ratified or even signed this, and yet, and yet she's citing it. So this is some of the, the mischief that you can get into. This is an article that, a speech that she gave and then published in the Idaho Law Review. And then she generally said to respect foreign international law as a matter of comedy and humility. Now, it seems to me that... Um, even if you're a proponent of this living constitution view or the, the constitution in 2020 that you know, ACS just had a big conference at, at Yale this past weekend about, um, if you're applying uh, changing standards and, and you know, the constitution changes with each generation and so forth, uh, then wouldn't you want to be uh, using the standards that are in the United States, within you know, our polity, within, that have some sort of democratic le legitimacy and accountability uh, to our political institutions? So I don't think that this is again, one of these originalist versus living constitution uh, debates. I, I just think it's, again, more about the relevance of foreign law to our interpretation. It's also um, as a, not a, a matter of the U.S. always having the more conservative law and resistance by conservatives uh, to applying these progressive changes that the world is going through. Um, the U.S. is actually more you know, liberal, quote unquote, and on issues such as the exclusionary rule. No other country in the world uh, lets criminals go free on so-called technicalities. Um, or the First Amendment. You know, the United States has the greatest protection for free speech than anywhere. Certainly more than England, where we've, we've seen the, the raft of libel tourism and um, uh, the use of, of defamation law to, to shut down journalists there. Um, and forget about the barbaric countries. I'm not talking about the U.S. being more liberal than you know, Saudi Arabia or Sudan or this parade of horribles. Um, look at Costa Rican law on uh, uh, in vitro fertilization, abortion, gay marriage. Um, you know, we think of Costa Rica as a progressive, right, and enviro tourism, all of this great stuff. Uh, their court is, you know, you, you would read their court decisions on these certain issues, and it's much more conservative than anything uh, that our court has done. Um, Rick mentioned the debate between uh, Justice Breyer and Scalia, and I, I do urge all of you to go online. There's a video, there's a transcript. It was at American University in January of 05. Um, Breyer makes the very strong argument that, look, you know, we live in an international world. Why not use all of this useful information that we have uh, coming out of these really smart uh, judges who are learned and speak English and whatever else? Um, that they face similar issues. You know, they have to deal with abortion and the death penalty, and you know, we're all part of the human condition. And uh, why not just read their opinions? And obviously, it's not binding. Nobody's saying that. But not, why not read that and learn? Well, Scalia replies, um, it's because these types of uh, foreign decisions are, are, and uses of the foreign decisions are laden with ideologies and, uh, and values-based uh, justifications. Sure, it's proper to use, for example, ancient uh, English law, uh, which was you know, before the ratification, before uh, American and English law diverged. Uh, but that's different. People saying, ah, Scalia, even he uses foreign law. I mean, that, that, is, that is a very different exercise. If, if you want to know what uh, um, reasonable means in the Fourth Amendment context, sure, it's, it's look at what reasonable meant in the English common law in 1789 or 91. Why not? Um, the, the point is, I mean, Breyer sounds, sounds reasonable, but the problem isn't references to foreign law. It's how foreign law is used by judges who assert power reserved under the Constitution to the people and their elected representatives, and whose desire to learn is limited to finding arguments in support of conclusions that have little constitutional warrant. What's been overlooked in these debates is the crucial difference between the legitimate use of foreign materials as mere empirical evidence that legislation has a rational basis and its use to buttress the court's own judgment uh, to, and decisions to override legislation, compare uh, Lawrence with Glucksburg, as I mentioned. 
the importance of this distinction can't be exaggerated. It's not only a question of respecting the separation of powers. Uh, in, the United, in the United States, unlike countries where constitutions are more easily amended, the court's constitutional mistakes are exceedingly hard to correct. The unhealthy ripple effects of judicial adventurism, such as using foreign law, are many. Uh, legislatures are encouraged to punt controversial issues to the courts. Political energy flows into litigation and the judicial selection process rather than uh, lobbying and legislation. Uh, in short, uh, I'll, I'll cite Richard Posner, um, you know, who's written on everything under the sun, including this. There's a, an article in Legal Affairs in July, August 2004. He cited, he kind of boiled the, the problems with citing foreign law to four. First, there's promiscuous opportunities to cite selectively. Um, it's akin to the Supreme Court looking to lower courts or unpublished opinions. Um, you know, there's, a, there's a plethora of, of information out there and um, uh, you, know, you, can, you can pick and choose, pick, look into the crowd and see what, what is favorable to you. Secondly, uh, foreign countries emerge from different socio, historical, politico, economic, um, institutional backgrounds. Uh, and literally a foreign const context. There's no such thing as a universal uh, natural law, and judges aren't a single elite community. For example, we think, I'm mean, not talking about specific federal statutes or the tax code or you know, things that obviously don't have an exact parallel in, in foreign courts, but you know, universal, we think about human issues like uh, abortion, right? Uh, well, you know, everybody, everybody's human. In Germany, they perform abortions in the same manner that we do here, but Germany has this whole history of eugenics and the, uh, the Nazi experience. Surely that context has an effect on how judges interpret uh, Germany's foundational law. That must be different from how we interpret ours. I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong, but it's simply inappropriate and inapt uh, to use those uh, laws and judgments coming out of uh, those experiences. Uh, third is the undemocratic character of citing foreign decisions. These are issues of legitimacy and accountability. We elect our, um, uh, our representatives in Congress and at the state level. Uh, there's a constitutional method of picking judges. There's a, you know, we elect our president. There's this checks and balance and separation of powers. Everything is uh, calibrated to be politically uh, legitimate, you know, going back to first principles of how uh, a government is set up out of the state of nature. Um, obviously, foreign governments um, or foreign tribunals like the unelected, uh, you know, non-accountable non European Court of Human Rights, as great as they may or may not be on whatever issue you care about, are not uh, accountable to the United States. And so applying their judgments uh, and interpreting our foundational document is simply illegitimate. There's no other word for it. And finally, this is an excuse for judicial fig leafing. Uh, using foreign law to cover up decisions based on personal ideology, uh, values, different social theories, and as I said, buttressing uh, predetermined uh, decisions. There's an important difference between law and policy. Okay? I, I myself study international law and comparative law. Uh, I travel quite a bit. I, I enjoy learning about what other cultures and legal systems have to teach us and how best to set up our institutions. Um, but there's a difference between comparative constitutionalism or comparative law or politics um, and the judicial process. There's even a difference between comparative uh, legislation. Uh, it would be remiss of Congress not to look, as they are now in the health care debate, of how uh, health care systems, health law works in Canada and France, wherever. Absolutely correct, because why not see how these different experiments have, uh, in policy have worked abroad? When you're drawing up a constitution, absolutely look at how uh, institutions, checks and balances, the parliamentary versus presidential system, all these different issues work abroad. Absolutely. Again, it would be uh, malpractice of, of a sort uh, not to, to look abroad. Uh, that is why the founders referred to the uh, decent uh, respect for the opinions of mankind in the De Declaration of Independence. Um, but look at what else they cited in the, de in the Declaration as a reason for the revolution. They said that King George had, quote, combined to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution and unacknowledged by our laws. So these things are not intention. Being an internationalist, being a comparativist, and yet rejecting the use of foreign international law in the judicial process. Uh, while the world is increasingly inter interconnected economically and, 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 and policy decisions have international political consequences, the world is not a single legal community. And so the judge's role 
as distinct from the legislator's role or the diplomats, um, should not take into account foreign law. Uh, I mentioned, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll mention this case, Roper versus Simmons, and then I'll tie up. Roper, the case that, that uh, uh, struck down the application of the death penalty to juveniles, again, a, 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 a policy matter that I take criminologically no position on. Uh, but you know, it cited the, 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 the opinion cited the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, uh, which was not ratified by the United States, the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which the United States had explicitly taken a reservation regarding the death penalty. There was no cite to any US ratified treaty or convention, um, directly binding or not, creating a private cause of action or not. Um, and uh, there was a discussion of countries where all death penalty was abolished, not just juvenile, which isn't completely um, honest, frankly. The court has retreated a bit after Roper. There's, there was a backlash. Um, and, for example, cases like Boumediene and Heller uh, had historical sites to what to interpreting the Constitution, as I said, in the way that's, that, that Justice Scalia is known to do, looking at the English common law, um, to understand its original meaning. Uh, but there haven't been such, such egregious examples um, since Roper. We'll see again this fall in these Florida cases what the court does. Uh, in short, it's illegitimate to cite foreign law because acknowledging foreign government rulings in our jurisprudence compromises self-government. I'll refer you to uh, an article in the Stanford Law Review by Ilya Soman and John McGinnis called Should International Law Be Part of Our Law? Uh, talking about the democracy deficit, problems in transparency and accountability. Uh, secondly, the Constitution itself holds all that the justices need to interpret the American rule of law. And third, we have the Supremacy Clause. The federal law and the Constitution uh, are supposed to trump Foreign, uh, uh, foreign law. They're, they're the law of the supreme law of the land, except in these law of nation cases that, as I said, are a historical, um, uh, narrowly grounded exception. We have enough disagreements in interpreting the Constitution using American law and legal theory. There's no need to introduce this dubious level of uh, illegitimate complexity. Thanks. Thank you, um, and thank you to Mr. Shapiro. First, it's a pleasure to be here. I literally feel like a strong sense of deja vu. In fact, I think I saw some of you when I was here speaking a few days ago um, uh, in an event sponsored by the American Constitution Society. So there, there was any doubt of my ecumenical leanings. I really um, am, am deli as delighted to be here uh, with the Federalist Society as I was um, with ACS. In any event, thanks um, to all of you for coming. Um, I find this, in some respects, um, a complex question, and I'll say why uh, in a minute. Um, but I think for present purposes and the purposes of debate, I want to take a position, and that way we'll, uh, we'll go back and forth and see how we, uh, see how we come out um, for the purposes of assessing the strength of, of both sides. Um, I think it's useful, uh, as uh, Mr. Shapiro did, to start out by making clear what we're not talking about or at least maybe where we have some areas uh, of agreement. Um, and in part, I feel like it's important to do this because so often, at least in Washington, when people say international law, they sometimes mean treaties, they sometimes mean foreign law, they sometimes mean customary international law. And, and generally, they're not at all. And by they, I mean uh, including, and perhaps most especially members of Congress, um, not entirely clear about, about what, in fact, the, the, they think the problem is. Um, treaty obligations are not foreign law. Treaties that the United States has signed and ratified are under the Constitution, Article 6, the supreme law of the land. They are a much as part of all our law as any statute that the Congress might pass. Um, that, I think, is, is, is not at issue today. And, and we can talk about Medellin and, and recent cases, but, but I want to set that aside for the time being. There is also the issue, and, and, and here I still can't quite tell um, how far apart we are in this. But for me, the notion of citing foreign law, a decision by the High Court of France or the High Court of Britain or the High Court of Zimbabwe, for that matter, um, as non-binding precedent in service of a larger discussion. Now, this, too, has been the subject of substantial controversy. So when Justice Breyer, several terms ago, 
cited some of the decisions of the high courts of France and Britain um, in service of dissenting on an establishment clause case, a case about whether or not it was a violation of the Constitution's establishment clause for public funds to go to the um, state support for vouchers for sectarian education. In other words, whether there could be public funding for religious education, even if indirect through the use of vouchers. Justice Breyer dissented in that case, and he did so in part um, by explaining why he thought our establishment clause uh, likely prohibited that kind of commingling of state and, and, and religion. And he cited British and French law for the purpose of saying, look, those laws are different. Their establishment clause equivalents uh, come out of and are part of societies which, with much greater religious homogeneity than our society. Our constitution was written for the purpose of and in the interest of creating and sustaining a society that was religiously diverse. Um, our constitution, in contrast to those constitutions, should be uh, interpreted to maintain that separation. We are not living in a religiously homogeneous society, and we shouldn't interpret our uh, founding documents in the same way. Um, despite the fact that he was citing foreign law for the purpose of distinguishing our country from other countries, this particular opinion in many respects kicked off or at least was a major catalyst in the debate about the use of foreign law. Not only did I find this use of foreign law unobjectionable, um, I found it clarifying in that much like any justice might use a sports metaphor to distinguish the argument he was trying to make in any, he or she was trying to make in any particular case. Um, here it seemed to me enormously useful in clarifying and in helping to make Justice Breyer's point, a point he was making about his assessment of the meaning of the US Constitution uh, as distinct from that of our allies. As long as these examples clearly not used in any sort of binding way, even when cited favorably and not unfavorably, as Justice Breyer did in that case. Um, as long as they are used wisely and in full recognition of the context in which they arise, um, I don't have any greater objection, and I don't see the basis for any greater objection to discussing foreign law than I do to discussing, for example, the contents of the Brandeis brief that discussed empirical facts in the world, than I do to the use of sports metaphors in judicial opinions, or any other particular logical um, device that a justice may wish to use in elucidating his or her understanding of what the Constitution means. Those two things, treaties and the non-binding use of foreign law as an explanatory measure, I don't find problematic and I don't find um, objectionable and I think also is probably not the nub of, of what we're debating today. So what are we debating um, today? I think the more complicated questions arise not with respect to interpretations of the First Amendment, for example, uh, which after all is directed quite specifically to our Congress. Congress shall make no law. One would, be, one would be surprised to find international or foreign law coming in uh, for the purpose of, in any binding or real way, elucidating the meaning of that amendment. But instead, we're talking about pretty much two specific amendments. The Fifth Amendment, in particular, the substantive due process understanding of that, uh, of, of that amendment, um, that arises, for example, in the context of gay rights cases, in uh, right to die cases, in, in reproductive freedom cases, and a host of other contexts. And we're also talking probably most prominently about Eighth Amendment cases, cases requiring the court to interpret the meaning of the cruel and unusual punishments clause. Um, why do I think that this is not a problem? And I think it's not nearly as much of a problem as, as, as others may think, or at least as Mr. Shapiro may think. Um, first of all, unlike, again, for example, the First Amendment, the text of the Fifth Amendment and the Eighth Amendment set specifically and very self-consciously comparative relativistic standards for how they wish the document to be interpreted. The questions posed by those amendments are, what process is due? What kind of punishment is unusual? It would be surprising for the Supreme Court to come up with a method of interpreting these words and these phrases, what's unusual, without looking around and asking, well, what is usual? The text, I would say, quite clearly, asks for some sort of empirical comparative analysis to be made. Indeed, these textual commands, most especially with the Eighth Amendment, less so, although, uh, although also with the Due Process Clause, these textual commands led the Supreme Court of the United States over a period of many decades to create a set of doctrines in these areas that reflect the kind of contingent uh, standard setting that I think the text anticipates. 
So for example, how does the court determine when some right is uh, a fundamental liberty interest um, under the substantive due process clause? How's, how does it determine whether or not a state law uh, banning sodomy is a violation of a fundamental liberty interest? Well, it looks to principles of ordered liberty and whether or not uh, a right is, in the court's words, over many cases and in many contexts, firmly rooted in our history and tradition. It doesn't say our history and tradition in the United States in most cases, it just says the history and tradition. So, for example, when this case, uh, when this question first came to the Supreme Court, or most prominently came to the Supreme Court in Bowers versus Hardwick, which I think Mr. Shapiro mentioned, um, the majority in concluding that uh, laws banning, it said, the Supreme Court said homosexual sodomy, in fact, the state law at issue didn't say anything about homosexual homosexuality or not, it simply banned sodomy. Interesting to say the least that the court concluded that what the law was really about was homosexuality, but set that aside for a moment. The court in deciding that this law was fine under the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution said, look, decisions of individuals uh, related to homosexuality have been, the subject, have been the subject of state intervention throughout the history of Western civilization. The condemnation of those practices is firmly rooted in Judeo-Christian moral and ethical standards. So here the court is invoking the history of Western civilization and Judeo-Christian moral and ethical standards and saying it's fine to ban homosexual sodomy. It was quite self-consciously and expressly in response to Bowers versus Hardwick and that specific passage in Bowers versus Hardwick that the court in 20 years plus later came back and said, you know, we're not actually sure Bowers versus Hardwick got it that right. As a matter of fact, if one looks at the practices of Western civilization, and then it cited a series of foreign laws, treaties, and other indicia of what the practices of Western civilization were, Western civilization, including but not limited to the civilization of the United States, it concluded that in fact there was no such clear uh, practice banning, banning homosexual or any other kind of or any other kind of sodomy. Um, so it was quite self-consciously in refuting uh, something that the Supreme Court has long done. I, I'm singling out Bowers versus Hardwick because it's so specifically clear in this instance, but the court is hardly limited to Bowers versus Hardwick in considering and interpreting these broad provisions of individual liberty interests uh, and so forth, what civilization and history uh, are doing. The second, and I think more important in many respects example is from the Eighth Amendment. Here, the textual command uh, that uh, cruel and unusual punis punishment should be prohibited has been understood by the court for many decades now to require them to look, how do you figure out what's cruel and unusual? The court said, well, you have to look to, and this is the doctrine as it stood for, for a long time, the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of maturing society. Now again, in that sort of doctrinal language, the court didn't specifically say maturing American society. It, it was never quite that limited. It simply said the evolving standards of decency that mark the progress of maturing society. If what matters is what's usual and what's unusual, um, and the question is, well, what counts as civilized society? It would at least be surprising for a set of framers of the US Constitution, some of whom were self-consciously Francophiles, uh, all of whom viewed themselves as acting in a tradition of rights, uh, certainly of European rights, uh, as they stood at that, of that era, to consider that all we should do is count up, at that time, the incredibly limited set of US, US jurisdictions alone and look, what, look at what kind of punishments they were using. Um, on the contrary, I think it would have been not only um, uh, more plausible, more common, but almost incoherent for them to say, well, to figure out what's cruel and unusual, let's look at what the 13 colonies are doing right now, or even fewer than 13 colonies, um, in, in, as, as some of these uh, ideas were being developed in advance of the drafting of the Constitution. On the contrary, what the framers were interested in, the reason they wrote the Declaration of Independence was to explain to the rest of the world why it was uh, that they thought themselves justified in declaring independence from the crown. So this notion of uh, expressing a decent respect to the opinions of mankind is very much is very much grounded in this idea. Now in this, I should distinguish uh, the point that Mr. Shapiro was making. In interpreting, in the service of interpreting the Eighth Amendment and what the cruel and unusual punishment clause means, the US Supreme Court 
as it periodically, randomly, and most often in footnotes, although not always, cites foreign law, international law, and so forth as part of its case for trying to understand what's usual and what's unusual. Uh, it's not uh, considering itself in any way, I don't think it's considering itself in any way, bound by these foreign laws. Quite the contrary. This is an exercise in the interpretation of the US Constitution. The source of positive law is not the Constitution of France or the particular statutory provision of the United Kingdom or even the European Convention on Human Rights. The positive law here is the cruel and unusual punishment clause, the, the text to which we have all agreed. The question is not what's the source of positive law or are we bound by the law of some other sovereign? The question is what interpretive methodology do we use makes most sense for giving meaning to the law to which we have all consented. Okay, so this brings me to the to the last and I think maybe nubbin of the nubbin of the dispute, which is this notion that in some way this particular interpretive methodology, uh, again, particularly when it comes to the Eighth Amendment, is somehow non-democratic or anti-democratic. And I want to make in this regard um, at least a few points. What does it mean to say that this method of interpreting the Eighth Amendment is non-democratic? Well, one thing that Mr. Shapiro and, and, and some of his colleagues might be concerned about is that it's anti-democratic for the Supreme Court to override, say, the Florida legislature or another legislature that announces, uh, we think it's good and well for juveniles to be subject to uh, the death penalty or for juveniles to be subject to uh, uh, life imprisonment without parole. And in fact, that's an important argument, the notion that the state legislature passed this, who's the Supreme Court to override it? But this is not at all an argument about foreign law or international law. This is the classic argument of the counter-majoritarian problem of the Supreme Court of the United States. That is, this is an argument that it is anti-democratic for nine unelected justices to have the power to declare the meaning of the Constitution or not, in some cases, overriding the views of democratically or more directly democratically elected legislatures. Um, we can argue at length about whether or not this is in fact the, the counter-majoritarian critique of the US Supreme Court is accurate, uh, whether or not we're troubled by it, whether or not we're especially troubled by it when it comes to values issues like questions of due process and death penalty. Um, but in fact, this is an argument that um, has nothing to do especially with the use of foreign law. It is an argument that comes in in service of one of the reasons why we don't like the interpretive methodology that the Supreme Court has with its power to declare what the law is in this particular kind of case. The second point I want to make in this regard um, is in understanding a different aspect. And this, I think, is the most important aspect and the most troubling aspect of the critique um, in, in, in interpreting clauses like the Eighth Amendment in particular. And here, um, the argument I had made is, look, the amendment says look to what's cruel and unusual. Um, how do you figure out what's unusual? Well, you have to figure out what's usual first. Um, what if it is more democratic in looking at the usual practices to look at what is usual only within either the sovereign territory of the United States or within somehow the democratic polity of the United States as understood as a function of citizenship or by some other criterion? Um, and here, I think it is, a, it is a wise and important question to ask, well, do we care what's usual on the rest of the planet, or do we just care what's usual for the citizens of the United States? This government, this constitution, after all, uh, we consider ourselves legitimately bound to because we, at least in some distant past time, centuries ago, at least on, by ancestors who were in some sense related to all of us who were citizens, um, this is the one we consented to, not the usual practices of other nations. But I think this argument is, it, it both proves too much and is overstated in, in several respects. First, unlike other um, clauses of the Constitution, like the 14th Amendment, for example, uh, that distinguish between rights or concepts that apply to citizens of the United States and rights or concepts that just apply to persons or in general. The Eighth Amendment is very much um, a proposition that applies in general. So there's no particular reason to understand that the Supreme Court has never understood the Eighth Amendment and the provisions and its nature as somehow limited exclusively uh, to what's going on with US citizens. 
Secondly, and, and perhaps most importantly, um, in any case, the Supreme Court always, in these Eighth Amendment cases, gets to the foreign law, the international law, whatever these citations are that are of such concern, at the end of a lengthy discussion of what every other state in the United States is doing. So I don't think, I, I think I would be much more concerned if the Supreme Court were simply ignoring what all of the United States were doing and all of the legislatures and all of the public opinion polling here in the United States showed and simply concluding we like the European system better, we're going to imply this. That's simply not in fact what happens, it's not what the Supreme Court does and I don't find the need to argue against what might be a problem if in fact the Supreme Court were doing something that it doesn't do. It's using this as part of its explanation for why um, this practice, the particular practice in challenge, executing juveniles, for example, is unusual, not only in our society, but all over the world. Finally, I should say, and this is in, in fact to some extent what Justice Breyer uh, has said to members of the legislature who've said over cocktail parties um, or what have you uh, that, gosh, you know, if you really find it so interesting to look at what's going on in the UK and Britain, Zimbabwe, at least could you not say it in your opinion? It's embarrassing. Um, or my constituents don't like it. And that is, after all, a completely reasonable position for a publicly elected legis legislator to take. But in fact, I think Justice Breyer's response, or what I would imagine Justice Breyer's response um, is to that, is the one more consistent with the rule of law. And that is, if judges are charged with saying what the rule of law is and why we think it is what it is, we have to look to something in interpreting the meaning of the cruel and unusual punishment clause. Now, some people, like Justice Scalia, who, after all, takes an extraordinarily minority opinion in the Supreme Court, thinks the only thing that's relevant is what was cruel and unusual in 1789. Now, you might take that view of the Constitution. Most people don't. Justice Breyer doesn't. And if you are not one who thinks that constitutional interpretation is properly that, that methodologically limited, then what do you look at? You look at the text, you look at the history to the extent it's useful, you look to public debates at the time, you might look to popular opinion of the day, today, as opposed to in 1789, and you might look to any evidence you can find in our country or abroad of what seems to be um, usual or unusual. It seems to me that that approach to interpreting the Constitution and saying that that is the approach one is taking to interpreting the Constitution is a more honest and rule of law like way of judging than taking an overly constrained and indeed um, idiosyncratic approach to constitutional interpretation that is after all also not specifically set forth in the Constitution. That is to say originalism. The Constitution nowhere states that it should be interpreted only as according to how it was interpreted in 1789. On the contrary, for decades now the Supreme Court has said, particularly in the Eighth Amendment context, we want to look to the law as it evolves. One might not like that doctrine, but it is certainly a doctrine of US law. Um, and one can fight against that doctrine, but it is not a fight against foreign law. It is a fight against the American law as the Supreme Court has come to interpret it. Let me conclude then by saying, um, I guess consistent with the last remark, that my fear is, however important I find the, should we be looking to the community of our country or should we be looking to a broader community and understanding what's usual and what's unusual? I think that argument is important and real, but my fear is and my suspicion is that foreign law, as it's been used particularly um, in the Congress of late, uh, but perhaps more broadly than this, is as has judicial activism been used, coming to be a formal hook uh, that indeed hides an underlying argument, which is in fact an argument about the substantive outcome of the decisions of the Supreme Court. I'll conclude there.